Welcome to Get Paid for Your Pad, the definitive show on Airbnb hosting, featuring the best advice on how to maximize profits from your Airbnb listing, as well as real life experiences from Airbnb hosts all over the world. Welcome. Get paid for your pad. 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 This episode is brought to you by Hostfully, a company that helps you make beautiful guidebooks for your listing. Make your own at hostfully.com slash pad. And as a special for Get Paid for Your Pad listeners, you'll get a free guidebook consultation after you make your guidebook. Welcome, Get Paid for Your Pad, episode 198. Today, I'm very excited to talk to a super host from Germany who has who has been using Facebook as a way to provide local recommendations to his guests and also as a way to promote his listing. And this is something that really interests me because I think a lot of people are you know, looking to promote their listing, looking to find ways to promote their listings outside of Airbnb. And I think Niels has done a uh, really good job. So welcome to the show, Niels Becker. Hi, Jasper. It's good to be on your show. Catch me in my home office here in Spain. Yeah, good, good morning, I guess it is for you. It's a late afternoon for me here in Taiwan. All right. <laughs> Niels, could you share to start your story? I know you're, you're an investor. You have five units under management. We're also going to talk a little bit about the difference between renting out on Airbnb and long-term renting, because that's something that you're experimenting with and you're trying to figure out what's more profitable. So we're going to talk about that as well. But could you give us just a quick short summary of you know, how you got started on Airbnb and what your experiences have been so far? I'm renting out on, on long term on, on my units for quite a while, for about six years now. Near my listing, there is an American air base, and usually we rent to American military, which is a very nice thing to do. The rent is backed up by the U.S. government, and so it's a, a very sure source of income. I have one small studio, which is the listing that I have which never rented because it's very small and long-term renters didn't really like it. So I thought I would plunge into the adventure of short-term rentals by trying or checking out with this unit and seeing how it would work against long-term rentals and how the revenue would develop and, and see how it would work. This is how I got into the Airbnb about six months ago. And you're obviously doing a good job because you're a super host. And I also wanted to mention that the village where Niels is hosting is very, very beautiful. It's called Dudeldorf. For those who are familiar with Germany, it's kind of near the border with Luxembourg. It's a very beautiful area. It's called the Eiffel. It's quite, there's a lot of hills and it's very popular among Dutch people because we don't have hills. And so we always love to go to places where there's a lot of hills. It's a beautiful little village. I, I even think it's gotten some wards, right? Right. It's a small village that's fighting. That's beautiful, but it's fighting against people going away from it to the big cities. So it's trying to preserve its heritage. So um, all my units are in 200 uh, year old buildings that I have restored to modern standards. In this area, they even give you, the authorities give you money if you take up the enterprise of restoring local heritage. You, you get awarded, I think, like 20,000 euros per project or something like this. Okay. That's very cool. So you took advantage of that. Let's talk about your, your Facebook page and also the reason why you started it and you know how you're using it, because I think that's really interesting. Yes. My, my problem was I'm what you call a remote host. I'm sitting here 1,000 miles away from where my listing is. I was trying to figure out how I could provide like that home feel, that personal feel, that guided by a local feeling uh, that Airbnb is providing to people. So I thought, why not use a Facebook page for the listing where I can share interesting things that are going on in the area, tips on other little villages or towns or cities that you can see 
what I share on there is content that I take from some Facebook groups on the area. It's like one group of has like 8,000 members and all they do is uh, getting out, trying to find secret hiking tracks, small villages and, and things that are not known. So it's local insight at its best. I just share this on the Facebook page so um, guests can take advantage of this. And I guess the guests can also find the Facebook groups that way where you find this information. Exactly. They can, you know, get more insight on, on the area by joining by these groups. Some of them are public, so you can, you can see all the other content that they have. The only thing I add is that um, what the distance from my listing to the advertised villages or the photographed villages or the event that's going on. So people can say, oh, yeah, we can try out. This is only half an hour away. We will we'll go there. Looks nice. Um, originally, I had thought to serve this content uh, myself onto the page. So last summer, I went to the place where my listing is uh, with my wife. And I said, oh, we have to go to the River Kill Valley and take a picture of the biking track. And she was not very fond of spending the whole vacation, you know, going to take pictures of, of things. And so I found this a much easier and more convenient uh, way because these photographs that I'm finding, they're really cool. They're, they're really nice. I mean, people really make it, do a good job. I mean, it's virtually just sharing on the Facebook page. So it's three clicks and you're set. Awesome. So it's, it doesn't really take you a lot of time. And I bet you probably discover some cool things about your area that you didn't even know existed. Exactly. Almost everything I had on there, I had no prior knowledge it even existed. <laughs> I, have to, I have to admit this. <laughs> wow, so you're learning a lot about your own area. That's cool as well. Yeah. Yes, so I do. the Facebook page, if you want to check it out, it's at Living in History. I literally just looked it up. If you type Living in History, it will come up. The full name is Living in History Dorf slash Eiffel. Yeah, I think it's, it's such a creative solution because I think everybody is aware of the fact that you want to provide your guests with local recommendations. Everybody knows that. And, you know, people use different methods of delivering that information. You know, some people are, they welcome their guests. Some people, especially the people who are remote hosting, they'll send like a guidebook, whether that's like a, a Word file or, or maybe like a PDF or even like an online guidebook. The thing is with those guidebooks, you don't want to update them every single week because that's a lot of work. It's a lot of work to update a guidebook. And so the recommendations that typically go into these guidebooks that are, you know, sort of the the evergreen recommendations, right? You're recommending local bars, local cafes, restaurants, but things that are that are new, like an event or different places in the in the area. There's so much so much going on in an area, you can't really stuff everything into a guidebook. You know, using a Facebook page just to share, you know, the latest updates, the latest events. I think that's a great idea. And I love how you're sort of leveraging the other Facebook groups. And one thing that you mentioned to me is that when you first started doing this, you, you were a little worried that people would be mad at you for sharing their stuff in the, in those Facebook groups. That's interesting because. Because from my uh, experience, people love it when you share their stuff, usually on social media. <laughs> I quickly made that experience as well. I was, you know, just worried, you know, you have a lot of copyright issues. If you, you know, just take photographs from Google, you know, you, you can be sure that someone sooner or later will get uh, really aggravated. On Facebook, usually the photographers who have shared and taken the picture that I'm using, they give me a like or they even say thanks for sharing uh, my picture. So it's it's just the opposite way. They, they're, they're usually pretty thrilled, you know, that someone found their work interesting and they see that obviously, I mean, I'm not trying to sell that photograph. I'm just using it to share an experience these people have had to other people. So I think that's what it's all about. At least these Facebook groups are, are about this. You know, sharing, you know, local events going on. And what you said is right on a guidebook. It's very difficult. For example, now in the area, we have like small Christmas markets coming up. That's in Germany. That's one of the uh, things that's going on. So on a guidebook, you know, you would, as soon as they are over, you would have to ha delete this and update your whole guidebook for spring things coming on. 
I think that's a lot of trouble if you want to keep things that are close to when the guest arrives, uh, that are actual events that, that will be taking place in the area. So this, for me, is an easier solution. You're right that the guidebook is good for some basic information. Yeah, absolutely. And I think it's great. And other than a great tool to provide your guests with the latest updates on what's going on in the area, it can also help promote your listing. It can also lead to additional bookings, which is, you know, it's a really nice added benefit. Correct. What I do is I encourage my guests to, to obviously like the Facebook page. And some do voluntarily, or they even have like guest entries where they enter photographs that they have taken. And obviously, this play to all their Facebook contacts, and they come and see the Facebook page. And so it's a good way to promote the listing. I do have a book now button on it, which leads back into Airbnb so that it can generate bookings very swiftly and easily for people. It's starting to happen that people are using this. I have developed this method for promoting the listing on Facebook about two months ago, and it's starting to show first results. Yeah, that's great. It's really a win-win situation, win-win-win for yeah. everybody. So I think it's awesome. By the way, I'm just looking at your Facebook page and I notice people can also review your Facebook page. I wonder if it'd be useful if guests, other than review you on Airbnb, I wonder if guests would be willing to also give you a review on the Facebook page. Have you ever asked them that? So far, I haven't. The, the reason is I have been struggling really hard to get the uh, Superhost status. I guess all hosts on Airbnb know that in the beginning, it's a very hard time, you know, and you see that people sometimes give you reviews where you think it's not. I was lucky because I only have two four-star reviews and since I'm hosting and everything else is five-star. But I was a little bit worried if I had to battle like two places, <laughs> the Airbnb ratings and the Facebook ratings. But I have uh, thought about this because I think Especially if I would want to promote my listing through Facebook, the uh, reviews would be a key factor because they always are. For example, on, on Facebook, people could say, oh, yeah, I've stayed there. I like the place. Or, or even if they would only say, I love the area, that, that would already help a lot, I think. Yeah. Yeah, I would definitely not ask those guests who leave a four-star rating. I wouldn't ask <laughs> them to leave a review on your Facebook. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm not sure if people would be, you know, aggravating by saying, "Ah, oh, I had to do this review and now I have to do another one." I, I don't know, but it would be worth a try. I think at least the people who are super content, and I have some people who leave me excellent texts. Not only the five stars. I mean, what's more important even to me is that the text they say we felt at home instantly, or it feels like a luxury hotel room, and things like that where you know other people really see oh that that must place must be awesome host i can't emphasize how important it is to share recommendations of things to do or eat near your listing beforehand your guests won't have to go through tripadvisor foursquare or yelp they won't have to scratch their head and think about possible places right in the moment I've been using Hostfully to create an online and printable guidebook to show my guests my favorite coffee places in Amsterdam. They use my recommendations and I'm getting fewer questions from my guests as a result. I've also included screenshots of my guidebook on my Airbnb listing as a way to differentiate my listing from others. So make your own guidebook at hostfully.com slash pad. Awesome. Well, I wanted to also touch on the subject of the long-term renting versus Airbnb. From my experience, Airbnb hosting is definitely a lot more profitable. I always feel like it's about two to sometimes three X what you can make on Airbnb versus long-term renting. So I'm really interested to know what your experience has been so far as you're, as you're doing both. I'm monitoring this because obviously this is very important for me when I make the decision to possibly convert other units to short-term rentals. And so far, I must say that the income from this unit is double than the long-term rental that I uh, could make off of it. I have a good insight on, on this because, as I'm saying, all the other units are rented and at a good rent for the area. It's probably the top that you can get on long-term rental. But still, the, this little studio that I'm listing is making double of what I could get so far. I'm now going a bit into the off-season or low-season period, but still bookings are coming in. 
I'm really confident that I can keep up the 2x uh, at least. <laughs> to say it. And, and are these units comparable or is the one that you're renting out on Airbnb a bit different than the others? They're perfectly comparable from a standpoint where you would say location, how is it outfitted and stuff like this. The only difference is that this particular studio is smaller. It's less size. But when I compare the uh, revenue that I'm making, I'm doing this by the surface, you know, dividing uh, the square meters or square feet that one unit has versus the other and see what I can get. I started out with this small unit because it was just sitting there. So anything I earn is a profit. I, I don't, you know, I'm not under any pressure. Otherwise, they're totally comparable. The furnished units are all like, I mean, furnished like the one that I have listed. It's the same style. It's the same old buildings. I don't know if you're familiar with the British TV show called Somerset Murders or something like this with Inspector Barnaby. And there's all these cute small English cottages. This is like a German version of it. Okay. Well, I'm not familiar with that TV show, but it's, it sounds pretty cute. <laughs> <laughs> One other subject I wanted to discuss is the way that you manage your units because you, you live in South Spain and near Valencia, you, you mentioned. And so you know, you're quite far away from your home. How do you manage it? I do have a obviously a local cleaning service and, and management service uh, for any issue that can arise. I have uh, local people there. I totally can uh, rely on. And other than that, it's all automated. I have a lockbox where people find the key. I tell them the code. They can they open the box and welcome themselves inside. And just to provide some personal welcome. What I do is I write them a handwritten note where I say, welcome, so-and-so, thank you for staying, I wish you a good time, and all of this. And then I send this as a uh, photograph through the Airbnb messaging system. I'm telling them through all channels that I'm always available during their stay. And this is something I, I'm trying to keep up like 24 hours <laughs> a day. Uh, whenever there's something they can call, they can send something through the messenger services. The uh, communication is, is rated straight five star all through the uh, time that I'm, I'm renting to Airbnb. There has never been anybody complaining, saying, okay, uh, we were left alone or something like this. Although I'm never physically there. Yeah, that's really smart. You're quite creative, I have to say. I was thinking first when you mentioned the handwritten notes to me before we started recording, I was thinking you just write the note when you're in Germany and then you just leave it on the table or something. But you're actually, you're writing it in Spain, you take a picture and then you send it through the Airbnb messaging app, which now you can also use to send pictures. Like before you couldn't do it, but they changed that a while back. That's uh, super creative. I like it. Yeah, and I think it's something where people see it's not like a large hotel chain, you know, who will, you know, give you a welcome message on your TV screen or something like this, which is just standard. It's something personal, you know, to connect with people. And some guests, after they receive that handwritten note, uh, will respond in no time, say, yeah, we just came in and everything is okay. Thank you very much. And thank you for the amenities that you have provided. You know, I have some, you know, craft beer that I have for them in the fridge and some bottled water and, and all this kind of stuff. I mean, the next best thing to a personal conversation, which in my situation is, is not possible. In Germany, are there any rules versus uh, short-term rentals? Are there any restrictions in place or is that only in uh, Berlin? In my area, if you uh, convert something into something, into a short-term rental, if, if you have any activity, you will probably get a gold bet by the local authorities because they encourage to have the area promoted for more tourism, for people coming in. And so it's all opposite. We have a lot of uh, buildings that are not being used because people have passed away and, and the inheritors live in big cities far away. Anybody uh, who does a project like this and starts short-term rental, it's very welcome. It's totally opposite from what you see in big cities where they, the argument is always uh, short-term rentals are taking away places from for locals to rent. Here, it's totally opposite. There are no locals, you know. <laughs> so right. it's, it's good uh, if you do something and not everything, you know, becomes derelict and it's just falling apart. It's very much welcome. So it's it's a good situation for, for an investor. Right. It's very Airbnb friendly for a change. It's like weekly uh, where you hear about new restrictions. 
here in Spain, it has because I was looking in investing in something here in Spain, finding an Airbnb place. But here in big cities in Barcelona and Madrid, I think in the, on Majorca, you have already restrictions for Airbnb. Obviously, in Spain, there's a very strong hotel lobby who's always trying to to restrict the short-term rentals. Now you have to register your place and you have to have a lot of things that sometimes you can't provide. And it takes very long to complete the registration process. So I probably wouldn't uh, <laughs> would do this because on the long run, if you put a lot of money in it, it can become a nightmare. Yeah, so this is quite interesting. You know, I'm in the process of writing my next book on investing in Airbnbs. And one thing I'm doing right now is I'm, I'm trying to figure out what are the best areas to invest? What are the Airbnb friendly places? Because if you're going to invest in a, in a large city, even if there's no regulation yet, there's a reasonable chance that within the next five years or so, the regulation will eventually come. I think looking at smaller places, even like little villages such as yours, there's only a thousand people might be a really good way to go because at least you won't have any trouble with the regulators. Yeah, rural areas are probably a good place to invest. You have seen my page there and my listing. You see that what I'm charging would be ridiculous if you compare that to Amsterdam or Berlin or any big uh, city. But on the other hand, the uh, prices to buy a property or invest into a property are much lower. And as I'm saying, you're getting even public funds, you know, if you do so. You know, this can compensate for all the lower revenue that you that you can make. I mean, obviously, if you're in downtown Berlin, <laughs> you wouldn't be <laughs> charging what I'm charging right now, but you would pay a lot more to buy the apartment or flat or whatever you, you have. Right. So so for you, it's still pretty good return on investment that you're getting from Airbnb in, in your village? Yes, definitely. I'm very surprised. I read you a book uh, before I started out and I was a little skeptical if I could really get these economic goals that you were saying there. It does work. You know, I, for me, it has worked so far. I'm very content so far. Awesome. I'm trying, I'm trying to complete the total circle of one year, you know, to see how it uh, behaves within 12 months. And then I will take my decision to pull over other long term rentals to vacation rentals. Awesome. Well, I'll, I'd love to keep updated on your journey. When it reaches 12 months, maybe we can have you back on the podcast. We're running out of time. So thank you so much for joining today. Really appreciate your story. And it's great to hear that everything's going so well. And for all the listeners, thank you for listening. And of course, on Friday, there'll be a new episode. So hopefully I'll see you then. Bye-bye. Get paid for your pet. 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 Get paid for your pet.